Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Petsi Raffer, I'm with Ant Micro, uh, and I have a rather longish title of my presentation today, Consumulation with Reno DPI and System C Interfaces for Architectural Exploration and Development of SOCs. Uh, I'm a software engineer, uh, so I'm kind of used to nice things we have in the software development world. Uh, fast iterations, compilations that take not too long, and the ability to iterate fast on your, uh, on your products. So you can, in the software world, you can easily create some kind of a MVP solution rough on the edges and just verify it against your target audience or your market and then iterate and improve constantly uh, making your uh, product better. Uh, in the chip making, well, it's not always as easy. Of course, things take much longer uh, because of the, the level of complexity of, uh, of the tooling and, and the uh, process themselves. Uh, the waterfall approach where you want to, to uh, test your software against the ready product so when you have to manufacture the uh, for example, your ASIC that you're designing, then you need to bring up your hardware, then you need to verify your software. This, of course, does not scale very well. You would like to parallelize these uh, efforts, and of course, that's not a new problem. As, and, but if you take too long, of course, uh, your whole approach may get outdated, and the, the market will move forward, and, uh, and of course, your, your design will be just too old to, to uh, be successful. Uh, it's not a new problem, as I said, and there are multiple ways to, to mitigate it. Of course, you can work with uh, FPGAs, you can use uh, HDL tools, but if, you're, uh, uh, you ha if you have attention span of a software developer, as I have, which is comparable to a very small ferret, uh, then <laughs> you, you need to, to, to kind of speed this up, because, well, then you could, otherwise you get bored. Uh, there's, of course, behavioral simulation, which is nice, but it also doesn't uh, address all your problems. If you're iterating on the hardware side and on the software side, uh, and you would like to keep your behavioral models up to date, then this is additional work. Um, and of course, if you're talking about behavioral simulation, you sometimes leave out the, the important details that you would like to verify uh, when doing the testing. And of course, this is also not a new uh, discussion. Uh, people do partitioning of these uh, problems. If you, if you have a complex system that consists of parts that are well known and established and some that are moving and under development, you can kind of divide these into two, two piles and, for example, do functional simulation or behavioral simulation on the parts that are not moving or not as interesting from the um, let's see, development perspective. But if you're actually working on some part of the RTL, then you can treat this part uh, in a more, let's say, uh, accurate manner and simulate it directly from the RTL. Uh, this, of course, makes the, the whole process much faster. If you, for example, if you're developing a, I don't know, I2C, controller, then you don't need to, to uh, simulate uh, accurately the whole CPU, maybe. Uh, yeah, this makes, makes your process much, much faster, much easier to iterate on. The important part is that when you're a software developer, of course, testing the running, I don't know, some kind of unit test or verification suites on your IP is important, but you would, what you want to test is you want to test the whole thing. So you want to run your rich operating system, be it Linux or some RTOS, run drivers, run software that will use these drivers and verify if things kind of make sense together. Um, I'm at a micro, I'm working on Reno. Reno is an, our open source simulation framework, supports a bunch of uh, architectures. Uh, and one of the aims of Reno is to run unmodified software. So we don't want to compile your software for simulation you want to run the same thing you would put on hardware in the end. Uh, it's good for both development 
uh, work interactive and also in CI, so for running tests. Uh, and it can run actually the whole system. So not only the core, not only the peripherals on the SOC, but also you know, sensors connected to it or multiple platforms connected via some networking uh, interfaces. Uh, Renote is, in general, a, a behavioral simulator, functional simulator. Um, so, when, uh, for example, when we are talking about peripherals, we, we focus on their register interface or on the other interfaces that they expose, be it I2C, SPI, Ethernet, you name it. Uh, Renote works on all operating systems, but of course, just Linux. Um, so what is important to, uh, to know if we are going to join these two worlds of, of functional and, and uh, well, cycle accurate simulation. Um, the software in general doesn't want to know that it's running in simulation to a certain extent. We don't want to be extremely precise, but in general, it should be almost the same. Uh, if the software is trying to verify if you know, all the timings are right, then of course, probably, it will be visible that it's not running on real hardware, but, uh, but we want to do as good of a, as a, of a job as, as possible. From the Renote perspective, an instruction is something that is not divisible. So it's a single unit of execution, and it takes a single unit of time. Uh, how much time? This is configurable, uh, but it's something that is, let's say, basic from the perspective of the simulation. Uh, this leads us to the concept of virtual time, so Reno distributes time across all of the elements of the simulation, and this will be important a little bit later on. Uh, and as I said about the peripherals, the, we focus on the interfaces, so reads and writes on the bus, but also external interfaces as well. Uh, typically, processing in peripherals in Reno is instant. Not always, but, but that's, let's say, 90% of cases, uh, which will also be important later on. Um, whenever we create a simulation uh, in Renote, we use building blocks. We put them together, uh, creating the, the description of a platform. Uh, we have our own format called REPL, Renote Platform, uh, and it's easy to, to write by hand. Uh, it also can be very easily auto-generated, which we uh, use very heavily, for example, in our um, a system called Zephyr Dashboard. You can go there and take a look. I will not dive, to, uh, dive into this topic because I don't have uh, enough time, but the idea is that we can generate platform descriptions from, autom from other descriptions that are available. And if you take a look at this one, uh, you can see some similarities to, uh, to, for example, device trees. So to show a more complex example, uh, this is one is from, from my five, uh, risk graph software, but this is from from uh, Polarify SOC. I don't know if the, the font is uh, readable, but of course I don't want to go into details, uh, just showing that yeah, this is a, a CPU, it has some parameters. In this case, this is a, a instruction set that is supported on this risk 5 but also we have things like uh, interrupt controllers, UARTs, et cetera, et cetera. UARTs are available as some addresses, there are some interrupt connections. Uh, you understand the idea. Uh, so we want to use the same uh, method to connect our accurate models in RTL. How do we do that? Renote provides some abstractions that allow you to do it fairly easily, but before you select these abstractions, you have to also make some choices. First of all, you need to select which simulation tool are you going to be using for the RTL part. You need to decide how do you synchronize with these models, how often do you synchronize. This is related to, uh, to our concept of virtual time. We want to be eventually consistent from the time perspective with the RTL blocks. You also need to, to uh, choose how physically you will connect to these models, if this will be a, a library to Renode, or, or if you will be using sockets. Uh, as you can see, we, uh, I linked two repositories here. One is Renode Verlater Integration, one is Renode DPI Examples, uh, which indicates that we have native uh, 
uh, I call it native integration over later, but we also support the DPI interface. I will be talking about them uh, to, to compare them a little bit. Uh, so uh, Verlater generates C++, which is generally trivial to, to uh, compile to a library and to use as a, as a part of the whole simulation framework just by calling it correct APIs. Uh, but while well, not everyone is using Verlater for some reason, uh, if you're trying to compile Vivado into a shared library, it's a little bit tricky. So, but there is Mm, there are other ways to integrate with these uh, systems. For example, direct programming interface, uh, which is uh, known to, to people in the, the system Verlick world. Um, and it's supported by a range of tools. Uh, so it's fairly easy to create a common layer that will be supported by these tools that people typically use and connect via sockets uh, with Renewed. Uh, from the Renewed perspective, the protocol talking to this peripherals is the same. Uh, we have a wrapper on the Renewed side, and we have the bus implementation on the uh, RTL side. And for Verlater, we support APB, Axie 4, Axie 4 Live, Wishbone. We also have support for uh, custom function units for RISC V, so we can have an implementation of a particular instruction in RTL. And for DPI, we have AHB, APB3, Axie 4, Axie 4 Lite. Um, yeah, in this slide you see that the block is called Verlater Peripheral. I will not go over the details of, the, of these uh, parameters. It's not that important and we have them described in our documentation, I believe. But in general, it's not only about Verlation, it's also about any type of custom later peripheral. But we should rename it in the framework because b before this actually works. So right now it's, it's like that. Um, I will show you how to integrate with, with uh, RTL on the uh, example of FASVDMA, which is uh, one of our uh, publicly available uh, IP blocks, which is actually uh, already taped out and successfully used in production. Um, and I will show that's way too large. Yeah, I, I absolutely don't want to go into details, but just to give you an idea how much code is required to connect to, uh, to this type of block. So the, uh, on the left side, we have the Verlator integration. This is C++. So first, some, some handling of the, the uh, traces, uh, trace dumps. But here we connect the uh, bus signals to, we can have, in this case, as this is a DMA, we have two bus connections. So we have one as a controller, one as a peripheral. Uh, fairly easy to uh, understand. On the right side, of course, you have uh, signal names generated by, by Verlater uh, fr from the object in, the, in Verlater. On the left side, you have our own uh, layer of integration, and that's it. You also can have some interrupt connections. You, you declare some parameters, but yeah, we have 150 lines of code, and the integration is done. Uh, on the DPI side, it's also fairly similar. You can uh, declare some parameters, but the most of, most of the code just boils down to connecting signals to to our internal abstractions. Yeah, uh, also fairly fairly simple. So this is the idea, and you, this is all you have to write to to connect to Reno. Of course, we have to have support for a particular bus that you plan to. Uh, to connect with, uh, but yeah, well, the, I've, I've showed you the list of, of supported buses uh, a little bit earlier. Um, as I mentioned, we, we integrate with different tools. One of them is, uh, for example, Questa, and as we want to be able to automate Renode, it's also important that we can uh, just control uh, the basic flow of, of these tools uh, when starting the simulation. So this, oh, hopefully this works. It's probably very small, but, but the idea is that you just run a script in Renode and everything runs automatically. You don't need any additional interaction to, to start things manually. You just run a script. Um, what is difficult? 
we are joining two worlds together. Um, as I said, Renote uh, is responsible for distributing time to different elements of the simulation. And Renote expects that the response on the bus will be immediate. Uh, on the other side, processing in RTL takes time and you need to have clock cycles to do some kind of processing. Uh, and sometimes when this time is distributed, there is not enough time left to, to finish the processing. So we need to cheat a little bit, and we do that. Uh, so this is the very basic flow. Like the user tells the simulation, run for some time. First we execute the, uh, we give this time to the uh, CPU or CPUs that are in the simulation. Then we uh, take the, the RTL part, and when everything is done, we report to the user that we're done. But the, uh, it's getting interesting when we have transactions between these two elements. So first of all, when we have a transaction, when, when Reno tries, all well, the CPU that is simulated functionally in Reno tries to uh, read something or write something to, to a custom-related block, we, from the perspective of Reno, we need an immediate answer. And of course, from the perspective of RTL, we need to have the uh, time move forward to generate the answer. So of course, as I said, we need to cheat, so we advanced time just a little bit to be able to generate this answer. Uh, so this kind of violates this, this steady flow of time. But of course, we compensate for that in the next synchronization phase. So in the next step, we do not have run for 10 milliseconds for some reason, but for almost 10 milliseconds, just reduced by the amount that was required to finish the transaction. Uh, and whenever, yeah, this is a little bit smaller, hopefully legible, uh, whenever there's a transaction from the customulated block to Renode, well, Renode can generate the uh, answer straight away. Uh, it's not a big deal. We don't have to have the time flow uh, for that. But even if the, uh, this response is only started to being processed on the RTL side and we're out of time, it's not really a problem. We can report that we're done, and in the next iteration, we'll just finish the, the processing as required. And of course, these two flows combine, so uh, the time, time flow analysis can be a little bit tricky at, uh, at points, but we try to cover all the, the uh, <coughs> possible scenarios to have eventual consistency on the perspective of how much time has passed since the beginning of the simulation. All right, uh, I'm almost done. Uh, sometimes you don't need to use RTL. Since we have this flow to connect to external pieces, we can use systemc as well. Systemc is, of course, on the functional side of things. Uh, and with the systemc TLM standard transaction level modeling, uh, this layer is fairly compatible with Renode. Uh, we still prefer Renote native models because they are more, uh, we can do more with them. But if you have system C models that are provided by your vendor, uh, you can connect them to, to Renote as well. There is a repo with, with examples. And just to show you a very short sample uh, of the integration itself, the window on the right is the integration layer that is in Renote. It's not that important. But the thing that you have to write is on the left. So it's very, very short, as you can see. And that's, that's any, everything you, can, you have to do to, to connect the simple peripheral uh, to Renote. Uh, for the sake of time, I will just move forward. Uh, who is using this? Uh, we can't really say, of course, who, who, because we, we, we don't want to, to expose our customers. Uh, but the, the very later and DPI integration were uh, developed with, with microchip. Uh, it's been used a lot of, at Google. Uh, including the CFU integration and the, the Open Secura projects. We can talk about, more about them uh, later if you'd like. Uh, if you look at the histories of our repos with examples, you will find some company names who are also interested in this. And they're using it also if, both for their internal use, for practical development, but also to distribute to their clients if they do not have hardware yet. Yeah, summing up. Uh, you can get your firmware and RTL people working together from the same uh, first, uh, from day one of the development and have them talk together and well, share their thoughts on, 
on the interfaces, etc. You can mix and match these approaches. And we have tons of links you can check out. Go to see our blog. We have uh, all of these features described. And yeah, happy to take your questions. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for two questions. Let's put it like that. There's one. Yes, uh, before you answer, the question is if QEMU versus uh, Renode. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the concept of the, the uh, functional simulation is the same. We also rely on binary translation, but yeah, it's a different project. So, so Renode is, is, has its own uh, engine for, for simulating cores. There is another question. Michael gets a second one, sure. Um, <laughs> Wait a second, you can, you can speak yourself. Sure, thank you. I mean, um, you, the fundamental problem you're addressing is gluing two simulators together, right? Yeah. And they both want to be the scheduler. Yeah. And one of the things that System C does is have a well-defined interface to a scheduler so that you can then have lots of different stuff run together. Did you not consider having Renode be itself use the System C scheduler and then you could run it inside your simulator and have there just be one scheduler and not have to like play together with it? Yes, we have. We have implemented that as part of a project that, unfortunately, for some reasons, is uh, not uh, fully public. Uh, but for the practical use, it's way more convenient to re use Reno as, as a controller of time. Uh, but yeah, this is possible and has been tested in practice. And re Reno also has the ability to expose uh, its API to some external scheduler so we can tell, yeah, move forward and yeah, so this is also possible. It's I think that's really good, by the way, way because you see lots of simulators and stuff and projects, you know, that, for instance, network simulators, which would be quite cool if you could take one of your things and put it in a virtual network in a network simulator, but nobody wants to, like, give up being the scheduler. They yeah, want <laughs> that's a very good point. Renote is way better at being scheduler than all of these other <laughs> projects, so we should definitely stick to that. But we accept that some people might be wrong on that and, and might want to, to use a different setup. So, so we, we do expose the API for that. Fantastic. Thanks. Good answer. Good to our last point. Uh, give a round of applause to the speaker again. <laughs> And